and you you still get no in you get no countdown it it's already going oh okay great well in that case uh that's being included in the episode and hello everybody <laughs> you get to see how many oh god i forgot now. i forgot i'm not fucking editing this episode Shit. <laughs> that's right i am editing this episode <laughs> and you guys get to see how mean brad is to me now at the beginning of the episodes where he doesn't even give me a count in to record on oh i gotta keep you on your toes mate i gotta keep you on your toes yeah that's fair but anyway we are I'm not such a heartless asshole <laughs> most of the time <laughs> <laughs> but yeah we are bnb anime that's brad i'm blue today we're going to be covering odd taxi when we get to it because first we're narcissists and have to talk about ourselves what? No. No. We. No. No. No, never. <laughs> so tell me about your week. Oh, my week has been. My week's been kind of weird. I've been pretty closely following the um, Amber Heard Johnny Depp case. Um, uh -huh. because I very much enjoy law. There was a time in high school where I seriously considered going into law um, as a profession. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's hilarious to think about now, considering, you know, art. Considering art and considering my brain trying to read things, like I called this old taxi. Literally, last episode when I was trying to introduce it, it's old taxi. Oh my god, yeah, that's right. I completely yeah. forgot about that. I edited that episode, and you I did. forgot that. Yeah. So, hey, don't you dare mislabel this in all of the editing and uploading and what. I will try, but maybe I'll just sneak one in there just for funsies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, I've been I've been pretty closely following that that trial. It's been very very interesting to me. Um, and American law I find very interesting in general. Um, mm -hmm. but uh, but yeah, I've been following that trial. This week, the judge has a conference, so they're taking a week break from the six week trial. So I think we were at the mm -hmm. end of week four last week this week is was supposed to be week five but because of the conference it's just a, a rest week i guess um mm -hmm. but currently amber Heard is on the stand and if you've been on social media pretty much at all recently you've heard about this have you checked the twitter recently because yeah. i've they feel like i'm the reason as to why that's like so full of johnny depp and amber heard shit is because i keep clicking on it and like reading through the entire thread yeah yeah uh, it's quite a thing, but I, I've had, um, yeah, I've been doing like, I don't know, just like random things. I've been wanting to play the whistle, which has been fun, tin whistle. Um, uh -huh. but, uh, but yeah, I've been doing random things and I've been watching this court case. I've been going on the background. So there's a few YouTubers who do really, really, really good live commentary on it. There's one <clears throat> called Legal Bites, who is a lawyer who has a bunch of other lawyers come into her stream. And it's like, so normally there's like probably at least three lawyers or you know maybe a psychologist or like somebody else you know a professional of some mm -hmm. kind is in her stream at the same time and they're watching the broadcast and discussing it and they're quite interesting because they have different law jurisdictions and laws do vary quite drastically in the states mm -hmm. and so that they're, they're quite fun and they're also lawyers in different areas so you get like i don't know like civil stuff and then you get like people that do just like paperwork like like finances you know like l lawyers of different avenues which has been quite interesting to watch mm -hmm. there's also another lawyer um emily d baker who i've been watching her streams as well um and she's like a, a she was a district attorney for like a good amount of years and stuff i don't know she's got quite the resume herself so i've been hopping between those streams but anyway i've been feeling like my life is kind of like weird now because i don't have the case to watch and i've been following it so closely <laughs> and it's like you know when you're like you like binge a show, but the show's like a really long one. So you're like watching like Naruto and you're binging it or like One Piece or, you know, something where there's like over a hundred episodes, fairy tale. I don't know. Um, and you're binging mm -hmm. the whole thing. And then you get to either you catch up or you get to the end of an arc and you give yourself a break or like you, I don't know, something happens and you just stop watching it for a while. And you just, like, you just don't really know what to do with yourself during that time period. Like, that's been my background noise <laughs> for, like, for, like, four weeks now. And then it's just not anymore. 
Yeah, that would explain why my Twitter feed has been dry this week. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I am I am curious about your perspective on the Amber Heard Johnny Depp case. What are your thoughts and feelings? I'm very much behind Johnny Depp on this. I spent too long studying psychology and learning how to read people Mm -hmm. to be able to tell that homeboy is as innocent as possible. Now, he, although he may be guilty of drug use and alcohol abuse and all that other stuff, I, for not a single solitary second, believe that that man has ever struck her whatsoever. Yeah, I'm kind of with you on that. I mean, it's very... It's one of those things where you absolutely want to take everything with a grain of salt because, like, it's it's very difficult to believe, to want to, like, you don't want to believe that somebody would make up accusations like that, you know? Mm. And and so, like, you always have this part of your, your brain, I feel like, where you're like, you know, but, like, what if? And um, I just, I don't know, though. Like, it's, Johnny is, I've, and me and the twins have actually been following this case for years now. Um, and mm. uh, we didn't, really I'm just like we didn't really understand where the accusations were coming from when they first came out and because see, I don't know Johnny has such a good reputation but then also like abusers can sometimes be really good for like other people and not but like yeah I'm with you I'm team Johnny it's just like I think it's very it's one of those situations where you, you get very uncomfortable thinking that somebody would 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 do that somebody would purposefully make up accusations about somebody else and especially considering that these accusations have gotten progressively from what I've seen more and more and more drastic to the point where I don't think there's much else that she could accuse him of that we would consider to be worse yeah agreed and again you don't want to Mm -hmm. or you don't you don't even want to think that somebody would make up such allegations however just everything that I've seen and everything that I've read from her body language and everything else while she's been on the stand Mm -hmm. Like, nothing about it adds up. None of her stories add up. Her body language doesn't add up. And I read something the other day that just kind of, I guess, hit me harder than it should have. Mm -hmm. And it said, Amber Heard looks like she's playing Amber Heard on a sitcom about Johnny Depp. And I was like, damn. Yeah, I think that's the kind of how a lot of people are feeling about this. Is it her testimony at the moment? She hasn't finished uh, testifying, but at the moment... It feels very theatrical. Um, and I was mm. watching a, a body language analysis on it. There's there's two that I've seen on YouTube. Uh, I, I can't remember their names. If I remember their names, I'll put them out on the Twitter. Uh, if I find the links to the videos, I'll put them out on the Twitter. But um, there's two, you could just search it, Amber Heard body language analysis. Hundreds of videos will come up, but there's two that I watched. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that I thought was quite fascinating is um, one of them was talking about the... Um, muscle in your face like when when you're sad obviously um you like make the downward sad face you know um but what's happening there it's this i found this fascinating he was talking about that the the muscular structure of your face actually relaxes when you're sad so it's not tensing up and then when your muscles relax and then you try and like smile at someone so think of like a, a sympathetic situation say like uh uh, you're you see a kid lose a sports game right so you give him you're mm. sad for them um so you give them a kind of like a sad smile but your chin kind of wrinkles up you know so because and you get that like weird like chin wrinkly like mouth pout moment and it's just a second you only do it for like emotion and then it calms down the reason why mm. Amber Heard's is seeming so theatrical, at least in, in this person's, what this person said, was because she's tensing that muscle instead of relaxing the, the cheeks. I think I'm, I'm explaining this weird. Watch the video if you don't understand. But like when you're sad, your, your face relaxes. So then you might get a sad mouth. But because she's got her face tense and it, she's holding that posture that we would normally only do for emotion of like sympathy, um, it makes it seem like it, there's something off-putting about it, and that's why it's seeming like a huge performance. Is because she's not doing this mo- this motion that should just be a quick motion. She's doing it for like an entire sentence, you know. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, but that yeah, there's more analysis about that. But I found it quite fascinating. I found the the media response to this quite interesting as well because from what I've seen, 
the internet and the everyday public and people seem to be pretty much on Johnny's side, at least in my circles. I don't know if I'm kind of in a bubble of Johnny though. And then the media, like news sites and stuff are still kind of backing Amber. I haven't seen anything on those. I've seen a lot of like online news sites and whatnot backing Mm -hmm. Johnny. Mm -hmm. I do see a lot more mixed things Mm -hmm. like to where people aren't sure what to believe. And I feel like a lot of that is just like the media, not sure which sides to take because whenever inevitably one prevails over the other, regardless of whose side you're on, Mm -hmm they don't want to seem like they're the bad guys or they were the dumbasses that went after the wrong side. So they're trying to like play middleman amongst mm-hmm. it all. Mm-hmm. Which we deserve But no all. Twitter, like all social media that I've seen and pretty much everything else is all in agreement that Johnny is like 100% in the right. And this is 100% a defamation trial. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, First of all, I think it was just an incredibly toxic relationship both ways. I don't think either of them are right with mm-hmm. each other. They're probably both incredibly miserable in that relationship. Um, I don't want to say Johnny is completely innocent of everything. I don't think anybody reasonably would necessarily say that he is like completely innocent and I did absolutely nothing wrong because like you said he did abuse alcohol and drugs which is a illness and does need to be taken seriously and treated as such um I, I, the thing that yeah I don't know it's just a very confusing a very sad overall situation and I do think I think the thing that I'm most frustrated with is that this situation is going to be used in the future to discount real victims um stories mm-hmm. and that is on Amber Heard. <laughs> Yeah, 100%. But also, I feel like it also kind of sets a precedent as well of... Innocent to proven guilty, which we haven't really done here yet, considering we've both made up our minds. Yeah, but again, I've I've taken enough psychology courses and Mm -hmm. learned how to study people enough to where I feel like I've made up my mind. And if I were in the jury box... I don't think there's anything that Hurd's defense team would be able to say to convince me otherwise. Mm -hmm. Because again, as somebody who studied criminal justice as much as I have, anytime I'm looking at a court case, I will always look at it objectively. Like if I were in the juror's box, which way am I leaning? And up to this point, there has been absolutely nothing whatsoever that has made me even remotely like, put me in a situation of like a hung jury, like nothing about that even remotely screams. Like I would have no second guess whatsoever that she's guilty. She needs to pay up. Yeah. I, I mean, there's a lot of things that she's done. That's just like, if I'm, if I'm to take an an impartial stance on this, there's a lot of things that she's done that are not a good look for her. Number one thing is not, donating the money that she said she was going to donate from the divorce settlement and I think it ended up being it was supposed to be three and a half million I think one to a children's hospital and then another three and a half million to a different charity and uh and then another thing I do not think that her psychological assessment from her lawyer that because she's only brought so far one witness to the stand from her side um so mm-hmm. amber is now the second witness um but she'd only brought on a uh pr- a professional psychologist psychiatrist i don't know if she's a psychi- board certified psychologist i think um and uh and she had done an assessment but the way that that um testify testimony went was not only very bizarre in the sense that this um witness seemed particularly combative and wasn't very like just wasn't a very personable impression on the stand and that compared to Dr. Curry who was um Johnny's assessment of Amber and a lot of people I've seen have been wondering why she's getting a psychological assessment and he hasn't the reason for that is is because she brought her mental health at issue she said that she 
um, got PTSD because of the relationship with Johnny because of Johnny. Um, Johnny never claimed anything from his mental health. So he doesn't have to prove anything. She has to prove that she got PTSD from him. Um, that's mm. why she got a psychological assessment. He didn't. But yeah, I think that this medical professional that she had on the stand wasn't a good look for her. Her lawyers haven't been a very good look for her because they've also seemed very abrupt and, and rude. And I think the thing of like, if you are being accused of being, you know, aggressive, of being the person who has done bad, um, I don't think that you should have a team of people that are supposedly backing you that are presenting as aggressive. It just makes agreed. Yeah, it just makes it look like that. You know, you're you they because they're a representation of you. Not only that, but you're paying them. Yeah. To try to represent you in the best possible light, mm -hmm. and it's not going that way at all. Yeah. Did you see the theory that she um took cocaine on the stand? Yes. Everything about that motion, I was like, this bitch really just did cocaine. I, I don't know. The thing about it is that I'm I'm curious about is is I don't know if it's because I know that there are like things that you could do as an actor to make yourself tear up. But I saw that clip mm -hmm. and she didn't tear up immediately after. But if you put like Vicks on a tissue or something, you know, something that's like spicy or whatever, and you put it up your nose, then you'll cry, you'll your eyes will water. And she had previously mm. been accused in the media of the day prior having zero tears on the testimony, on the stand, you know, she was like making cry faces, but there were zero tears. So I could see mm. if that was the circumstance, but I didn't see her tear up afterwards. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if she just made a really weird motion with the tissue. Because the thing about it is, is like, it's one of those things of like, you don't think that she would be that dumb. And also courts are highly secure. Like they have a lot of security that they have to go through to get into courtrooms, especially one that's as public and televised as this, that is open to the public. Like you as a member of the public can go and sit in this courtroom. So, you know, the, mm -hmm. it's the, you, there's, the security there is probably going to be pretty decent, I should think. So I don't know if she just made a really weird image and like a really weird motion and it looked really bad or if she really is that confident in herself mm. that she thinks she can get away with it. Well, the thing about it is, is that everything about that motion from the way the tissue went up to the inhale to like all the facial muscles and everything like that. Mm. hitting like she obviously did something whether it's coke from the way that the like all the body language and everything acted it was like she definitely like inhaled something yeah that yeah that was the thought from me too but just all of the like hand gestures and everything like it led me to believe like okay she had to have snorted something not just inhaled but it seemed more of like a snorting type situation yeah, it was a quick, deep breath. Mm. So, not sure. But that's where I'm leaning. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, yeah. I, it's going to be interesting. The The cross, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to cross-examination. If you guys are curious about this case at all, if you haven't watched anything and you don't really know much about it, I know that both Legal Bites and Emily D. Baker, who I mentioned previously on YouTube, have um, shorter videos where you can kind of catch up. Legal Bites has done a video after every day's worth of testimony, um, and she does a really good job of summing stuff up. So if you're curious and you want to catch up, I would recommend her channel specifically to go through and just catch up. Emily D. Baker, I think she does like a podcast episode once a week on a Wednesday or something and covers like all of the detail kind of thing. And she uses more like clips and images and, and references to stuff. Whereas Legal Bites is literally just a talk through summary because she's been streaming for like the entire 12 hour day by that point. Um, uh, but yeah, if you are curious about this and you want to watch the cross-examination where Johnny's team um, uh, tears apart Amber's testimony or doesn't, I don't know, we'll see. Um, that's probably going to be on Tuesday, maybe Monday. Um, uh, so yeah, the day that either the day after this podcast episode comes out or, um, two days after 
if you're watching on YouTube, it's probably already passed, but you, the court case is still going on. So if you're watching on YouTube, you can see, um, what are we on week four? So you'll have another week of, of, of podcast, another week of testimony to go through and closing arguments. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you're curious about this, let us know your thoughts and opinions. I think that this would make a really good anime. I mean, I'd be down. The story is very, like, adult anime. That makes it sound like I'm talking about porn. Mm. Like, no. Like, <laughs> you can't put the word adult in any circumstance and not have it sound sexual. So, speaking of adult anime. <laughs> I have corrupted another soul this week. Okay. So my friend Bonk that I've talked about on here a few times. Mm -hmm. Earlier this week, she was trying to find something to watch while she was getting ready to make dinner. And so we're just all chilling in Discord. And she was like, yeah, I think I'm going to watch Attack on Titan. I was like, or, or, hear me out. Mm -hmm. Food Wars. (laughs) Mm-hmm. She's like, all right, bet. <laughs> I've corrupted another one. <laughs> this is so good. It's so, so, so good. God, it has no right to be that good it's at so all. Good. And yet, oh, uh, God, it's amazing. You just got to get past the weird of the first season. And once that's over with, you're, you're golden. Yeah. Like the show yeah. just gets so much better. And she got far enough into the season to where I think she started to realize that. Yeah. But I was afraid I lost her after the first episode. I was like, fuck. No, it's like you <laughs> We've lost it. another one to how weird it is. Yeah. Yep. Nope. Nope. She's hooked. I win. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. I'm glad. I still think uh, about some great. of the food from I, Shokugeki I, you know, so well. I still like, I'm like, oh, God, I wish I could make that. <laughs> so she brought up a really good point of something that I need to do in mm-hmm. the future. So whenever I eventually move back out onto my own and get my own place again, Mm -hmm. what I need to do is finish collecting all of the manga Mm -hmm. and then do a stream series and then therefore upload it onto the YouTube channel of me making every recipe from the Food Wars manga because every volume has a recipe from the show in it. Ooh, yeah, you should so do that. I was like, that's a great idea. I'm going to do that. Yeah. You should so, so, so do that. I've already got the first two volumes, so I'm working on it. Then you have to send me all the vegetarian ones. I can do that. Yeah. Shouldn't be too hard. Although I say that it's probably going to be quite hard considering how much of the stuff is made from fish. Yeah. Yeah. Meat, fish, fish broth. That's very common though. It's like, um. One of the biggest things of, of like, is why I've always spoken about when I go to Japan, um, eventually, I will get there eventually. It was supposed to happen years ago, but then COVID happened and now, you know, life. Um, but when I, when I finally go to Japan, it's going to be, I'm going to, it's going to be one of those moments where I'm like, okay, I have to re- relax my vegetarianism, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, and you don't have to, you can be fully vegetarian in Japan, but a lot of the things, even if it's like just like a broth soup and there's no chunky meat in it at all, they still have like anchovy oil or um, like something small in it that is an animal product. Um, or it's like they use, yeah, it's like beef broth or something. I don't know. And it is possible to do it more and more mm. as, as it as it gets, it's, as vegetarianism becomes like a bigger thing out there. Um, and like the, the Buddhism and stuff, like it's a big thing in certain areas, but it is, it is more difficult than out here. I think from what I've heard from other vegetarians. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and especially considering that I don't just want to stick to the cities. I want to go to like small town places. Um, it's, you know, Mm. it is what it is. Yeah, I definitely think a short conversion over to pescatarianism would probably be a good idea. Mm-hmm. Just solely for the trip, just so you know you don't starve or become malnourished. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the biggest thing for me, the reason why I'm vegetarian isn't necessarily because I don't like 
meat, you know, and it's not like I have anything against any, any meat eaters or anything. The biggest thing I have an issue with is the amount of waste that is created in the meat industry and how bad it is for the environment. Mm. And a lot of the time, how cruel it is to the animals, depending on which source you get your meat from, you know, I know that there are exceptions. Um, I feel like in my head, <laughs> at least, um, fish countries, like countries that eat heavily fish or fish locations i feel like if you're in like i don't know new orleans or something um they probably do it as well you use a lot more of a fish than you do of like a cow oh yeah definitely yeah so there's less waste and i mean even asian countries are really good about letting like no part of the fish go to waste because even the bones can be made for stock yeah well that's one thing that i found i mean england is isn't the best but we do tend to eat more offal than you guys do out here in North America. I say you guys, I live out here in North America, um, than out here in North America. Things like, you know, steak and kidney pie or um, liver and onion pie or whatever, like those kinds of things aren't like, Blech. yeah, <laughs> they're not like normal to have. Mm. Whereas like you can, you can get steak and kidney pie at like a pub in the UK. Yeah. You know, so I feel like there's just more of more of this waste. And that's coming from someone like I live in Alberta as well. Or like my parents are in Alberta when I'm not in Toronto. I'm in Alberta. And Alberta You're in the beef is, capital of the world. Yeah, it is. Yeah, there's a heck of a lot of beef that comes out of here. So every day I'm seeing these huge cows. And then I get to the shop and I don't see all of their parts there. And I'm in the place where they're they're there you know so it's like out of all of the places that you would think that would have everything you could buy you don't mm -hmm. you know and i just get curious as to where all the rest of it kind of goes like, what do you do i think with a like true butcher shop you have a lot more options mm, and have true. the ability to get a lot more parts of the cow because butchers definitely aren't going to waste something like that yeah but a but a lot of larger chain establishments and stuff like that, I can guarantee you that there is a lot of waste because of stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause I'm just like, I, cause I really want um, a, uh, like a bone handled knife. I think that would be really cool. And so I'm like, I want to get like a cow hip bone. So mm -hmm. I can like make shit out of the hip bone. Like, I think, I don't know. That's just a side story. I'm a vegetarian, but give me a cow hip. <laughs> like, I get that sounds like a very hip food. idea. Yeah, but like I feel like that would be that would be really cool to like make stuff out of it. And like I've had moose meat before, and that was really good. Um, I think I spoke about this a few times, but like a twin's uncle is a hunter and everything, and I went up to go stay with them in in Buttfuck, nowhere Newfoundland, and um, uh, had moose meat out there. And it's like those guys use every single thing, and I think most hunters and stuff do. Like if they're they're killing their own game, then they're Mm. Gonna make sure it's worth it, you know. They have to drive all the way out into the mountains or whatever to go and do all this, process it, and get their license and and pay for the gas. Like it's it's not cheap to do that. But yeah, anyways, that's my rant. Let's get into old tax. Old, I did it again. Odd taxi. Damn it, blue. <laughs> <laughs> show this show some respect. It deserves it. Nah, now nah, I'm gonna get the name wrong every time. Odd taxi. It is um very much for adults oh 100 percent. like yeah. this is not for kids no. whatsoever no it's rated a pg-13 i'm jumping ahead of you you get to do your background stuff after today because i'm going first <laughs> um i mean it's not like even if i went first you have the ability to control the narrative considering you are editing this you can make me sound like the biggest asshole possible yeah i can do that <laughs> I was just thinking I'm if ruined. I remove if I remove the word sound, you can make me the biggest asshole possible and then take out how can I how can I make that to say that you say that you are the biggest asshole possible? I'll figure it out. I am the biggest asshole possible. Oh, you did You're it. Welcome. You did my There's your sound bite for the episode. <laughs> There's your sound bite for the episode. You're welcome. <laughs> but also remember how much dirt I have on you sitting on my hard drive. Uh, that's true. Okay, fine. Fine. Because how much stuff have I sent you that I've cut from episodes? 
<laughs> That's true. That's true. Oh, in fact, I have a joke from last week still sitting on my hard drive. Uh, yeah, that's true. Okay, fine, 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 fine. <laughs> Anyways, PG-13, which I thought was low considering the content of this show. I will disagree to the point of if I can go watch Doctor Strange today yeah. and that is classified as a PG-13, mm. then this is mild compared to that. So yes, PG-13 is fitting. If I hadn't just watched Doctor Strange, I might agree with you. But after watching that, and that's a PG-13, God, no, this is PG-13 every step of the way. Okay, good to know. Well, but it's too, it's too smart. For, I, I feel like, 13-year-olds to be able to understand, though. Oh, crash. Yeah. Um, so, so, like, I, from a rating perspective, yes, it is 100% a PG-13, but parental guidance is definitely needed mm -hmm. for the sole fact of this is not for everyone. This show, I'm not going to lie, made me uncomfy watching it. I don't know if it did the same thing to yeah, you. Yeah. But early on, like, I was very uncomfortable watching this for the sole fact of the show hits on a lot of things and it's very real mm -hmm. um i think the best way to describe this is it's on the same lines as like criminal minds or csi investigations or whatever like it's a it's a cop show um that goes into like those kinds of um fbi cia style investigations it's more small town than that it's set in tokyo but it's more small town than that in the sense that like you're not dealing with a um large organization you're dealing with a district police force um but it is you know pretty much everything that you can check the boxes on with those criminal shows um you got your gang violence you've got your you know young people involved like I, it's a um it's a it's a cop show so with that the, the plot is very interwoven. It's smarter than Criminal Minds or CSI Investigations or whatever because it's not like um, one story wraps up in an episode. This is an entire season worth of one story and um, things get revealed. Things You start off on a very confusing foot. You get more and more and more confused and then slowly things get revealed as you go. Um, so... It's one of those ones that uh, it deals with heavy topics. It's, you have to pay attention to it or you're going to miss things. I think even if I rewatch this a second, third, fourth time, I would still notice new things. There's a lot of foreshadowing that you don't realize is foreshadowing. There's twist turns, surprise corners. Um, it's wrapped up in a cutesy anthropomorphic uh, animals are humans vibe, you know, like, um, uh, uh, like most children's cartoons, I feel like, or like, you know, like Arthur or um, uh, I can't think of anything else now. Like, you know, that kind of thing wrapped up in that. The reason, yeah, the reason why I feel like PG-13, some 13-year-olds are going to love this. If you have a 13-year-old that listens to crime podcasts, that listens to, that watches like Criminal Minds or whatever, you're going to, like I was that 13-year-old, um, you, you might have some of them that absolutely jump on this shit and they love it and they love every second. So you're going to have other 13-year-olds th that this is incredibly heavy for them. They find it draining and exhausting and it's not for them at all. And you're going to have some other 13-year-olds um, that it's just not their take it's slower and not um it's not like you know attack on titan or anything there's not like a whole lot of crazy action consistently throughout so um and yeah there's a lot of just investigation and talking and things happening in conversations um yeah that's my my thoughts on that um Rating, it is a 4.33 out of 5 on Anime Planet or an 8.66 out of 10. It is an 8.75 on my anime list, which means that this is one of the rare shows that ranks higher on my anime list than it does on Anime Planet. Um, I've said this before, but I'll just reiterate. My anime list gets a lot more votes than Anime Planet. The reason why I take Anime Planet into consideration is because that's where I get our dropped rate from. But my anime list gets a heck of a lot more votes I find them to be pretty much consistently the same, except Anime Planet is usually 
like a half a point to like 0.25 higher than my anime list. It's very rare that they're drastically different, which is why I feel like the drop rate is reasonably like accurate. This drop rate is a 5.62, which I think is small for a show like this. Yeah, I kind of expected around that amount, maybe even a little bit higher. Yeah. Just because this show is not for everyone. Mm -hmm. Again, this is something to where if you take it at face value and don't pay attention to a lot of the underarching subplots, Mm -hmm. you're not going to appreciate the show for what it is. But I, I have absolutely fallen in love with the premise of this show. The show was created from nothing and became something amazing. The manga began serialization right before the anime was released, which tells me that the anime went into production before the manga was ever made. Mm. So for a show this deep Mm. and a show this intelligent... Like, this was on Bunny Girl Senpai levels of intelligence and mm. overall, like, overarching story points. Like, I I hold this in that high of a regard because Bunny Girl Senpai is, for me at least, the standard of what, like, how psychological and intelligent a show can be. It's like Bunny Girl Senpai, Death Note, first half of Death Note anyway. That type of thing. Hmm. Yeah. So this was right up there with it. Yeah. This show has, um, like I said before, it's got a lot of foreshadowing in it. It's got a lot of, a lot of twists and turns. I agree with you. It's a very, very smart show. And I find it fascinating that the manga um, was written during the projection of the, of the show, because I remember thinking whilst watching it, wow, this mangaka had a crazy brain to have planned out this entire series from the beginning volume, from the beginning chapter. But if it's turning out that it's not even them, then I have to like hand it off to the script writers or whoever was writing this. Because damn, like it's convoluted and crazy and insane and there's twists and turns and keeping up with all of it. Like, it, it genuinely, I, I want to watch it a second time because I feel like I'm going to catch so much the second time that I didn't the first time. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. It's definitely something that's rewatchable. Mm-hmm. But again, to Kazuya Konomoto, who did the writing for both the manga and the anime, mm. just brilliant, brilliant work. Like, I cannot stress enough, like, how well written and how well done yeah. The show is for something that I just kind of stuck on the schedule on a whim just to give us something to watch in between and give us something a little bit shorter before we try to do some longer stuff over the summer. Mm-hmm. Holy shit, this exceeded all expectations of what I had for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I will say I freaking loved the OP. <laughs> Oh, the OP was great. The ED was also great. Yeah. But that OP, OP, something about it just sticks with you, man. I, I The only way I can really describe it is it's it's Odd Taxi by Skirt and, and Poonpi. I don't know how you say that. Um, uh, but it is, um, in, in my way, like my way of describing it is it's like a an old cop show um, OP, but lo-fi. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I can 100% see that. Yeah, because it's it's got some fantastic saxophone in it that is just a huge jam. But yeah, it really, really feels like a, like a you know, a 90s, maybe even late 80s era cop show, like sitcom, mm-hmm. like, you know, uh, uh, just daytime TV cop show, but make it modern yeah. and lo-fi. I can 100% yeah, see that. It's a fucking jam. It makes my a guy. lot of sense. Like it's it's up there. It it is a jam. It's up there with um uh Tanaka Kun's OP for me. Like it's such my genre of music. I'm adding it to a playlist. It's so freaking good. I can see that. I yeah. can 100% see that. Yeah. Anyways, I skipped your background. So do you want to jump into your background? Yes. Yeah. My background, I mean, we've We've talked about the author already with Kazuya Konomoto. Mm-hmm. The it, the manga was illustrated by Takechi 
Abariah. Mm-hmm. It's a seinen, which makes sense. There's nothing shonen about this whatsoever, really. Mm-hmm. The original run or the manga began serialization on January 15th of 2021 and is running to present for a total of three volumes. I don't know if that means that the manga will eventually progress further than the anime. I hope it doesn't Mm -hmm. because I'm totally content with the ending that we got. Yeah. But that's just me. Like, I don't, I don't want to get greedy with this one. I am seeing in some reports that there is a film i'm just looking that up oh there yeah. is a film a film, uh, film which reconstructs the odd taxi tv anime and also depicts what happens after the tv anime's finale so it's a yeah reconstruction film that also then depicts after the finale i uh, let's see what it's rated it's rated a 6.28 out of 10 hmm. so like two and a half points lower It also hasn't released in the U.S. yet, though, so Mm -hmm. I'm curious how it'll be once it releases in a North American market. Mm -hmm. Because, again, that's entirely the Japanese market. Right. So I'm quite, quite curious to see. Although, if it is a retelling of the original show, I definitely think this is something that I probably would take a few friends to the theaters to see. Mm -hmm. Just because I'm curious how they would handle it and enjoy it in that type of situation. Because I have some friends that would absolutely enjoy it. Mm. And then I'm there are others to where I would just kind of want to see their reactions yeah. to it. Solely because they're into anime, but this isn't necessarily their style. Mm-hmm. But I know they're mature enough to understand it and appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it'd be interesting. Yeah. But as far as more background goes, we have Studio OLM, who is behind making this, before we get into that info, because I can rant and rave all day about OLM, and y'all will have heard me rant and rave about them. But before that, the anime began in April of 2021 and ran through June of 2021 for a total of 13 episodes. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, back to Studio OLM. They are most well-known for Pokemon and Berserk. Mm -hmm. However, another little something that we covered not too long ago that has grabbed a hold of my heart and not fucking let go is Comey Can't Communicate. Yeah, yeah. I'm also just on their site, and I'm seeing that they have done Major 2 as well, Major the Second. Major Second. Yeah, I think we talked about that whenever we did Comey. Mm. I just didn't find that pertinent to me this time because I also looked this up right before we sat down to record while I was still talking about Doctor Strange. Did they do the first season? I only seeing Restaurant to Another World. I think they just did the second season. Right. Yeah, I don't think they did the first season. Mm. My brother read the manga for that and he loved it. I've also read the manga for it. Here's the thing. The manga, absolutely phenomenal. The anime, I don't much care for. Interesting. I feel like the story of the anime just doesn't match up with why I fell in love with the manga. Interesting. You'll have to let me know if your brother has actually watched the anime Mm -hmm. to get like his perspective on it as well. Because again, I've done both. And in fact, if it tells you anything, I think I dropped the anime. What? Like, that's how little it held my attention. Well, then maybe that's why they did the second season with a different studio. Maybe. So maybe I need to pick it up from the second season and see how Mm. it goes. I don't know. Mm. Well, so far, the studio has been pretty pretty good hits for us. I mean, yeah, Comey did extremely well. If we ever did Berserk, I feel like that would be a hit. So, you know, we out here, we gaming. Badminton anime? Love all play. Yes, it's currently airing right now. Well, they've done that. They're doing that, according to Anime Planet. You've got a badminton anime currently airing. You've got a competitive dance anime currently airing. You've got a golf anime currently airing. And it's a shonen golf anime, so do with that what you will. But it's also about a very well-written female cast. Interesting. 
Needless to say, the summer season, we're not going to lack for content that I'm going to make us watch. I'm so excited. You, again, mate, you have no earthly idea. I'm watching so many shows right now to where if I literally have to sit down and try to decide what to schedule where my brain is going to fucking malfunction. There is so, so many cool things that I'm looking at right now that my brain is getting overwhelmed and we're getting distracted. Back to old taxi. Odd taxi. Told you my brain was distracted. Damn it, Blue. Yeah, again, and this isn't something you're doing for a bit either. This is just literally your brain being your brain. I know you well enough to where I recognize that this is not a bit. It's not a bit. I kind of wish it was a bit because then at least it wouldn't happen in just like my everyday life. But this is a consistent thing for right? me. I replaced a word and that's it. I know you well enough to know that this is not a bit. No. But I should play it off like it's a bit. I should play it off like it's a bit just consistently. Just like every day of the rest of my life, just like, yes, I meant that word. Yeah, like just just do that, especially in real life too. It'll just be really good for riffing. Sometimes I just blame a concussion that I had when I was like 10. And I'm like, yeah, it was a concussion that I had. I'm like, I'm fully recovered from that concussion. It's fine, but I'm going to blame it on that. Well, I mean, no joke. People wonder about my short-term memory all the time. And I tell them like, I got a really bad concussion and then went to fuck to bed. mm me so too. who knows? That could be the reason for my short-term memory. It could be ADHD. It could just be my brain not giving a fuck. At the end of the day, who really knows? Honestly, you're like the male reflection of me because, yeah, ADHD, concussion, went to bed like an idiot, just sometimes a bit dumb. Uh, again, this is why we get along so well, and that's why this podcast works yep. so well. I had the opportunity to be the first guest on a friend of mine starting up his own podcast. And he was talking to me about listening to the podcast. And he's like, you and Blue like just play well, just so well off of each other. And I was like, yeah, because we're both pretty much the same person. We are the same person. <laughs> we're actually the same like person. We, we are, I mean, we're quite... Like, we bicker like siblings. We uh -huh. have very similar backgrounds to a lot of things. Yeah. Like, everything about this just works. And we're just idiots loving anime. What? I don't get it. Yeah. Brad's <laughs> the middle sibling in my family. Pretty much. Yeah. Like, I, I definitely fall there age-wise. Yeah. I feel like we had a point for this bit, and then it just it's kind of just, fell off the rails. <laughs> oh, God. It's midnight for me. <laughs> yep. It feels like midnight for me, but it's not. Odd taxi. Dinner. Odd taxi. God, I could just sit here and go on and on about this show. Yeah, okay. So I don't think we can describe it any more than we've already described it without huge spoilers. Because this is one of those shows that if you know any tiny detail about, it kind of spoils. Um, so I don't recommend it. It's rare that I do this, especially with something that I'm going to put like trigger warnings on. Consider the trigger warnings. If you've watched a criminal show, those trigger warnings apply. <laughs> so pretty much. Yeah. Um, so pretty much everything under the sun. I don't think there's really anything that this show doesn't cover in the sense of, of a lot of triggers, except perhaps like, uh, no, because even like, I know. Okay. Yeah. Any triggers that I label could spoil. So I'm not going to label any, just consider to apply anything that you would to a cop show to this, same triggers. Um, and yeah, if you are interested in watching this, I rarely do this. I don't recommend you read up anything about this show before you watch it. I don't recommend that you check out reviews or even a synopsis of the show will spoil stuff if you ask me. Trailers will probably spoil. Um, genuinely, dive straight in. Yeah, if you take anything away from this, the fact that I said it made me uncomfortable yeah. for the first half of the season, keep that in mind. And again, it's not, it didn't make me so uncomfortable I had to stop watching or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It's just the show gets real. As someone who enjoys anime for its entertainment value, the fact that it got real is one of those things to where you just, like, if you have triggers for anything with, like, crime shows or if you take my word for anything, just kind of keep that in mind. Yeah. 
this show deals with incredibly heavy topics. It does so in a kind of lighthearted way because the characters are animals. <laughs> um, and there is some comedy breaks throughout, but it's not a comedy in any sense of the word. Um, it is, it. I mean, I keep referring to it as being a crime show, but it is a crime show. So, you know, when you're like, you're watching Criminal Minds and then the team gets together and they have a coffee break and a donut and then there's a quick joke over the, over the office desk and then they fly off to another case. Like, it's that kind of thing. The jokes are very surface level, just a quick moment to give you a breather before they jump it back into the story. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so it's not a comedy in any sense of the word. It is very much a mystery um, crime show. So if anything about this has intrigued you about the show, if there's anything that we've said or done that even remotely makes you want to check out this show, mm -hmm. click off of this here now. Love you, bye, all that other stuff. Go watch it. It's 13 episodes. It's a relatively easy binge. Then come back. And you can listen to us bullshit about a show that we both enjoyed to some varying degree. Yes, yeah, and you can find out our ratings. Okay, see you soon. Goodbye. For the rest of you that stuck around, uh, because you've already watched it, hopefully, or you're just one of those people that enjoys spoilers. If you are, hello, weirdo. Uh, sometimes I'm like you, sometimes I'm not. Today I'm not. Uh, <laughs> 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 That's pretty much you anytime I go on a rant about any of the like multitude of anime that I'm watching for the season. Mm. It's like you're just along for the ride. Yeah. Well, I mean, but also, I know better to spoil because I'm not an asshole. That's true. Um, I guess the thing about spoilers is that if it's a show that I'm watching for just lols, um, I don't care if it's spoiled. Um, so, like, mm. <laughs> chances are a lot of sports animes, except I will get angry if you spoil a match result. But if you're like, ah, oh, this relationship happened, I don't really care. But yeah, that like slice of life stuff, spoil away, don't care. Joke, comedy stuff, don't care. This I would care about. I love crime shit. And this is so many twists and turns. I did not expect the ending. Mm -hmm. I had a theory about who, who was going to be the ending, but it wasn't that person. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, because this is a linear story, do we want to go episode by episode? I feel like it's more or less just an overarching story, yeah. even though it is linear. So I don't feel like we have to give an episode by episode breakdown. Mm -hmm. And also we've ranted and raved enough about it to where I feel like we can just kind of give the overarching story with like its main subplots because the door on the show is ever revolving. That's like true. you switch back and forth between characters. If there's, again, I realize that I have extremely high praise for this show enough as it is. However, this show does a beautiful job of fleshing out all of its characters, not just some, Yeah, all of them. Every character has a backstory, has a motivation for what they are. Some of them you get closure for, others you don't. But it makes you care about whether or not you actually got that fucking closure. Yeah. Like, I genuinely cared or was invested in every single of the, like, what, 15 characters that were in this show? Yeah. And one thing about... Like, holy shit. Yeah. One thing I really liked about this show is that none of the characters are particularly likable. You find parts about every character is flawed to the point where you're like, they're kind of a bad person. Um... Mm -hmm. And uh, and they have charming elements to them. But I couldn't say that there is any character. That, I mean, maybe there's a couple that you just don't really know too much about. Like, they are fleshed out in the fact that their, their story is fully involved. But they're very, like, um, it, maybe the, it's just that they're the more immature characters. So what you see of them is their innocence. Mm -hmm. um, they're kind of like, oh, you're like, oh, okay, I understand how you got here. You know, I you're not a bad person. But, like, the vast majority of the characters here, you're, like, supposed to pity. And you're like, I kind of don't because you did it to yourself. Yeah. If anything, out of any of the characters that I even remotely feel sorry for, it's Little Bro. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, Little Bro. And I guess Gorilla as well. Like, yes, Doc Gorilla. Yeah, the doctor. I feel for him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But everyone else... I mean the the kid that's like the kid that wins the lottery 
he you can you pity mm-hmm. him in the sense that he is a very ignorant young teenager like i'm assuming like 14 15 whatever like very obsessive in that in that era i remember being there where you um find something you like and that thing that you like is your entire world and you like it for like months and then you don't care about it anymore Mm. Um, and I can understand that because I feel like most teenagers kind of go through that that time period. I feel like a lot of people have that for like a band or uh, a book series or a film series or something. You know, the Harry Potter effect, the the Hunger Games effect, Twilight effect. Um, I think it's I think it's noted a lot more in teenage girls that you see it, but I think it happens just as frequently to teenage boys who get obsessed with like cars or the fast and furious franchise or those are the only things that are coming to mind apparently is right now is cars but um but a lot of guys get obsessed with anime around that time as well um i was also kind of getting into anime at that time too and you become very obsessive you're trying to find who you are as a person at that age and you're so you're trying everything and like you find a thing that you like and that becomes your identity and so he's a very relatable character in that sense um and you do you're like ah oh, but he's so thick he's <laughs> He's as thick as pig shit, poor lad. He has no brain. Yeah, he's none. He's too squish yeah. to be as thick as he is, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Because he, he just wants to do right by everybody. Like Otokawa did right by him. And so he, he wants to, you know, do right by him back. But at the same time, it's just like, no, don't don't get involved, man. Like we why? Yeah. Yeah, and it's the kind of thing where you can see him growing up into just a really normal person, like a really nice normal person. Mm -hmm. But at this point, um, very sheltered young teenager Mm -hmm. that goes through some crazy shit. Okay, so let's talk about characters because I feel like if we talk about characters, we'll get story. Pretty much. Um, So you've got our... Go ahead. Oh? No, go ahead. You were, you were saying? Well, uh, I was going to say we should start with um, Edgy, the monkey, because he is probably the epitome of a character that you don't sympathize with, <laughs> but shit happens to them. Like, because he's just, he's creepy, uh, manipulative. 40 something. He went to school with Odakawa. So you, you we established that Odakawa is in his early 40s. He went to school with Odakawa, so he's also in his early 40s. His story is mm-hmm. that he is really wanting to get in a relationship. And he goes on an online dating profile and he has had no success um, until he bumps up his his pay range because uh, on those dating apps, it's got like how much you make in a year. Um, and he ups his mm-hmm. his salary to I think it, it translates to something like two hundred thousand American dollars a year. Yeah, he went from uh, minimum wage like to, less than thirty thousand yeah. dollars a year to like two hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah, and I was like, damn, that's one way to lie. Yeah, and he follows through with this lie. He ends up meeting this um, eighteen year old girl, which w- odd. Um, and uh, and he's talking with her on the app. Otakawa straight up tells him, like, my guy, you're being scammed. Like, shit's going to happen. Like, And he's like, no, 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 she's mm-hmm. real. And he's like, yeah, but just because she's real doesn't mean that she's not. Like, there's a reason why this is happening, my guy. Like, connect the dots. Um, and uh, And he is progressing with this lie. He goes through with it. He goes through with it. He goes through with it. He takes her on expensive dates that he can't afford. He's saying that he is in these circles all the time, but he doesn't even know how to act in these circles. So the secondhand embarrassment is huge with him. And um, and he follows through with this to the point of buying an engagement ring, telling his mom that he is going to get married, taking out a loan from the gang and saying, like going through with the act of going to propose to this 18 year old girl who believes he is r- really rich. And and then he gets kidnapped and shit hits the fan for him. But the whole time, like, shit is hitting the fan for him. You're like, you're a weirdo. <laughs> like, you were going to yeah. trap this girl. You were going to marry her before she knew what you were actually like. And then what were you going to do? Take her to your apartment where you don't have the luxury bathtub you were talking about? 
Mm-hmm. Like this 18 year old girl and you've just manipulated her into marrying you and now you have to show your real face and what are you going to do? Like, dude. Yeah. So um, uh, he got his comeuppance in the end, though. Um, he has to work off the debt. And he turned his life around, mm-hmm. so good for him. Mm-hmm. Maybe now he won't be dumb. I hope he won't. I hope he learned his lesson. Who do you want to talk about? Uh, I mean, can we talk about the little shit that just wanted internet clout for a minute? We can. Yeah, so he was a hippo, I believe. Hippo? Hippo. Maybe. I think he's a hippo. Tai Chi. Yeah, Tai Chi. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a dwarf hippo mm-hmm. who is just so desperate for validation and internet approval to where he makes up a fake story about how Otokawa gave him some advice and wanted to take a picture with him just to kind of help his self-esteem. And then in that photo, you are able to clearly make out Dobu, who is our, like, one of our main antagonists of the show. We learn that there are several throughout. Like, he's the initial big bad, and then it turns out that there's a lot of big bads that we may or may not Mm -hmm. be able to see. So he, after that, after that post went viral because of Dobu being in it, he decides to essentially become Batman. But not Batman because he's too afraid to actually do anything. But he starts a cult where he can take everybody's money and he can reap the benefits. And then he eventually comes face to face with Dobu. Dobu beats the shit out of him and makes him apologize for everything that he did. And you kind of get growth, kind of. Uh, uh, <laughs> debatably get growth. Yeah, he's um he's a, a very interesting character because of the the commentary of um internet the relationship the characters have with in, with the internet um that's quite consistent throughout mm-hmm. this show um you see that even with Shin who who wins the lottery um and then posts his i won the lottery online and um because of that gets the gangs after him um and uh and yeah, you but you see that you see that with him a lot. With he's, um, um he's like a, a Jake Paul, you know. He's like he he wants the clout, and he's going to do what he needs to do to get the clout. And he's it's got really low self esteem, so he's going to you know manipulate things to make them seem the way he wants. And then he sleeps with his fans, and then gets mad about it when they call him out, and he claims himself to be a god. Um, and uh, and tries to become internet detective, and then has to follow through with it and hunt down real gang members. <laughs> and uh, then he realizes, oh shit, guns are real and can hurt people. Yep. Then it's like he kind of decides to turn his life around, but at the end of the day, he doesn't really. No. So it's like, oh, he might actually have growth, but then he sees. Uh, something happened with Otakawa later on. He's like, "Oh, I got to take pictures. This is gonna make for a great viral yeah. picture video thing." And it's like, "Okay, you're back to your old shit again. Fuck off." Yeah, um, yeah. The I I don't think he really learned much. I think he may just change the avenue of which he tries to go viral. And I feel like because of that, the only logical like next segue of who to go into is actually gonna be Dobu. Yeah, so Dobu is, he's a very interesting character because when the show starts off, like I said, the way the show is set is that you don't know anything to start with and you're just thrust into the story and then you have to catch pieces as you go to build the story as you're already like four episodes in and you're still piecing who everyone is together. It's not a, here's the characters, here's the plot, now we'll go. It's a just dive right in and figure it out as you go kind of story. Um, I saw someone in the comments compare it to a um, Tarantino style film. Um, And I think that that's, that's fairly a fairly reasonable comparison in the way that the story is set is that you don't get all of the information to start with. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Dobu is one of these characters who you 
believed to be the end result villain um, in the beginning and um, very quickly, well, I say very quickly, halfway through the show, you learn that there are, are multiple villains and he kind of is and kind of isn't. Um, he's obviously a bad guy. He is in the gangs. He uh, has done some really, really bad shit to um, Shirakawa, who we will go into in a moment. Um, but he's also, he the way he's described within the show is having his own sense of justice. And that is true to his character. He has his own morals. He follows the gang thing of like, you know, we don't jump into each other's business. Yes, he's my underling, but like, I'm not going to like, step into his territory or whatever I will keep him in line when I need to but like we have these unspoken rules that we follow and he's very much like the the noble gangster if you know what I mean Mm -hmm. yeah and then he is opposed by Yano who is a porcupine that only speaks in rap yes and then Yano essentially hatches the plan of robbing homeboy who won the lottery of his winnings and taking that money And continuing his own growth and showing off to his boss that he's better and eventually just ousting Dobu. Yeah. So Yano started off being Dobu's um, underling and then gained, like, his ranking up. Um, I was not a fan of the rap thing. And this may have just been... I think the translators... I worked just stopped. I think the translators did a very, very good job of keeping the rhyming pattern of keeping it subtitled well. I consider myself to be a decently fast reader. I was having trouble reading the entirety of the subtitle before the next line came, just because I think in the way that they had to translate it to make it rhyme, they made the sentences possibly longer. Um, and it's a very rapid, mm-hmm. fast paced. Um, you, I couldn't read the entire thing before the next one came on and process it and then read, because obviously he was doing it in the lyrics so things weren't like it's not like when you're talking and you're getting straight to the point there were moments where they had to add things or warp things or make things a little bit um more around the bush um to 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 make it fit i think the subtitlers did a fantastic job and you know i i tip my hat to them i would be interested to see this in english to see if it works better. Whilst being subtitled with his character, I found myself not reading his subtitles and then just reading the person who was responding to him subtitles and then getting the context from that. See, I feel like I didn't necessarily have that much of an issue with it. But also, with that being said, I also watched two other animes this week that had rap episodes. Mm -hmm. So I feel like my brain was just already prepared for it because yeah. Love is War and your boy Kong Ming just had me fully prepared to read multiple lines of subtitles at the same time. Mm-hmm. I think my brain was probably already working over time from this show anyways. And it, it like, I don't know. I also, when you binge a show, you don't give your brain a break, you know? So let me know if you guys at home mm-hmm. had trouble with his subtitles. I... Yeah, like I said, I consider myself to be a fairly decent reader and I was struggling a little bit with his. Um, And it just took me out of the story a little bit um, because of that. But I did find the moment where he dropped the wrapping um, because of his frustrations to be a really good point of his character, which is why I don't hate the fact that he's a rapper because I just feel like for me, it it was an issue with the subtitles and with the fact that I just wasn't keeping up. Like it's more of a me thing than the show thing necessarily. Um, yeah, uh, because I found that when he dropped the act, he, it was like a real, um, important moment for his character and then him picking it back up again, kind of in a way shows his own insanity and kind of supports the fact that he's fucking weird. Like Dobu has his sense of, of, um, morals, whereas Yano at this moment, it's very clear to see that he isn't. On like he doesn't have that same level of like, you know, we may be gangsters, but we follow these rules. Like he doesn't have those. He doesn't follow those. He does what he wants. Yeah, no, he is just pure bad. Yeah. Not the purest bad. We'll get there. Mm. But we're Yeah. But he is still like bad. He bad. Yes. Like he's into kidnapping for his own 
narrative like he kidnapped otokawa's best friend he is exploiting the mystery kiss band yes for you know one of the pure evil that we're gonna get there eventually yeah i think we should i think we should jump into that i'm kind of leaving our main character for last because his plot twist changes this whole shit yeah because i feel like we're probably gonna end on before them getting into uh what is it shinakawa and goriki mm before we go into Otakawa, just because they play a pivotal point in like us finding out who Otakawa is. Yes. Yeah. But also, can we talk about the door in his apartment really quick? We can. We can talk about the door in his apartment. Can we talk about how for 13 fucking episodes, we are left with the notion of he is hiding something in his house. Like he is talking to something. The police are in on it. His neighbors are in on it. The fucking criminals are in on it. Mm-hmm. They all want to know what's behind it. Come to find out it's a cat. Yeah. So that, that, that plot twist is the thing that keeps you for the entire series questioning whether Odakawa is a good guy or a bad guy. Because when we start off, when we're watching the show, we don't know if he's a good guy or a bad guy. Like I said, we're just kind of thrust into the plot line. It's not established. As mm-hmm. we're learning things, the characters, which is hilarious, they're talking, like the characters are talking, like at one point they say, I'm about 5% sure um, that you are the killer. Because, spoiler alert, it's a murder mystery. There's a killer. Um, and, uh, and, I think it's like you're at this point, episode nine or ten, and they're like, um, you, I'm about five percent sure that you're okay, like, um, or like ninety five percent sure you're not, and uh, and that's accurate to how the viewer is feeling by that point because you start going, yeah. you start by going, okay, we're watching the killer, and then you go maybe, and then you go, yes, we are, uh, no, we're not, no, we're not, no, he's good, he's good, yeah, is he good? He's good. No, he's no. I'm sure he's good. Mm. He's all right. Um, he, is he good? Uh, and it's not until the cat reveal at the very end that you're like, okay, yeah, no, he's good. It's fine. But also thinking on that now, like after we get to Otakawa yeah. and we discuss kind of what he went through and his transformation at the end, reflecting back on it now, that is such an impactful scene, though, like him seeing that and then having the realization that he does. Yeah, well, because he, like, well, we'll get into that, but yeah. Yeah, like that, thinking about it now and like his overall reaction to it, like I'm kind of getting a little emotional over it just because of the pure impact that that had. Mm-hmm. But we'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. So I think we should talk about the girl band now. Yeah, Mystery Kiss and their shitty manager. Yes. So, um Mystery Kiss is the is the the idol group that this whole murder mystery kind of centers around. It's the so there is at the beginning of the show it's established that there is a missing girl who's like 18 years old or whatever and she's been taken and she's been missing for a couple of weeks at the point of the beginning of the show at the end of the show it's been like 2 months or whatever. Um, like it's been time um and uh we don't know whether Odakawa did or did not take her we do know that she was in his taxi um because he is a taxi driver and uh and the girl the idol group she is a member of this idol group we don't really find out that she was a member of the idol group officially until probably like episode 12 like episode 10 episode 10 10 okay um something like that yeah something like that <laughs> bless you and Thank you. and uh and yeah so we, we're centered around so we have this main girl who is a um what is she what is animal is she who's the main well, like she's, a, she's like a poodle a poodle yeah she's like a dog um then we have uh, a calico cat and a black cat um, and, uh, so Poodle is the center of the group. She's the main girl. And throughout the beginning, consistently, everyone's kind of complaining about her in the sense that, like, she kind of runs on her own schedule. She doesn't have to do what everybody else does. Like, they're all working side jobs, but she and the idol group 
is allowed to show up late to set. She gets special treatment. She doesn't have to work with side jobs. The other two have to wear masks during their performances. She doesn't have to wear a mask. She's centric to the show. But also they're debuting. So they don't have a lot of clout, a lot of fans. So it's kind of like, well, why does she get this special treatment? Like, what's going on with her? Like, this is weird. Um, and uh, and we have this manager that's very quickly establishing that he has something sketch that's going on with him. Um, and as the show progresses, you learn more and more and more about that dynamic until, big plot point, um, the Black Cat is a replacement. She is not the original Black Cat. The original Black Cat is the missing girl that shows up dead. Um, and uh, the replacement Black Cat is it just like they, it's someone who from the initial audition came forth. So they chose three people from the audition. She came forth. Um, and then they contacted her when the first black cat went missing, which is curious. She is also the, the missing black cat is also the daughter of the mafia boss's school friend. Mm -hmm. So the mafia is like after whoever did it, but also helped cover it up. And it's like different sides of the mafia too. Like Dobu's after it mm -hmm. because it's obviously has something to do with his boss. Whereas Jano is after it solely because he's trying to cover up the fact that he's the reason the body's missing. Yes. Yeah. And he, but yeah. And, and Dobu is the one who is then kind of accused of being um, like they, they, he's number one suspect because he's kind of after it, he's investigating it. Um, Odakawa is also a suspect because she was in his taxi. Um, yeah, it's a whole different situation. That reveal is the last reveal of the show. As the killer is the last, the last big plot plot twist of the show. So I think we should. Yeah, it's pretty much how the show ends. Like it's that point mm. that ends the show. Yeah, because you kind of get to the point where like everything is all wrapped up, and they're having their final moments of like you know this is how they're faring afterwards, and you're like. Ah, oh, so we're just not going to know. And you kind of get complacent with that fact of like, okay, that's fine. And then they reveal it and you're like, oh shit. He's like, damn it. Damn it. <laughs> um, okay. So then we have the twins. So the twins are the two local police officers. They are raccoons? Uh, let's see here. Uh, meerkats. Oh, I would have never guessed. I wouldn't either, but I got the Wikipedia in front of me, so we're good. I guess it makes sense. Okay, so they're meerkats. Um, and they are, one of them is dumb, apparently. Like, you get the impression that he's dumb. Um, and the other one isn't. Um, the one that isn't is in on all of the badge stick um, with Dobu, like, teamed up with Dobu. And then the other one is, um, like, he's one of those characters that you, that is probably the only truly good character in the show other than mm -hmm. the doctor but he's just very hurt i think and reacts on the emotions that he's feeling yeah because he's not used to like having to deal with certain things mm -hmm. and he's very trusting of his brother he's not trusting of other people but whenever it comes to his brother he's like hardcore like i got you no matter what yeah yeah so we find out that they are orphans and the reason why they have such an initial bad impression or at least the dumb brother has an initial bad impression with Odakawa is is because their parents were killed by a taxi driver and hit and run um and so they are part of this um support group of young orphans that are then given placements and funding to deal with themselves um and grow up how they want and odakawa it is revealed is also part of this group um as well as there was somebody else who was also involved in that Can't remember. Uh, the people at the bank i think so i don't know but like several characters throughout are kind of sprinkled in that are also orphans of this organization. Turns out this organization is being funded by uh, the mafia boss, dude. Oh yeah, I know what you're getting at now. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, and the reason why bad cop, bad twin, um, turned bad was because he felt indebted to the mafia boss for giving them the funding to, to raise themselves and everything. And so turned bad to do deals for him to pay him back 
Um, and and that's how he gets kind of warped up in this mess. Mm-hmm. So then we have the comedy duo. Which doesn't really play too awful much of a point on the overarching plot. No. Like they interact with Otokawa and a couple others. Yeah. A couple of times, but that's really it. Although, again, they are very well fleshed out characters to not have fuck all to do with the actual plot point. Yeah. But they are still like... I don't know if I would have liked the show without them, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, and they're, they're such a, they're such a scene setting part because they have a radio show where they're doing this, the, the comedy duo, the straight man um, act vibe thing. Um, and that's pretty much always on in the cab during the first, like, eight or so episodes i don't know a lot of a lot of the the show take the beginning half of the show takes place inside the cab and these guys are always on the radio and that consistency keeps you into the story when there's a lot of dialogue and other like important things that are happening but aren't attention grabbing um and so this is the thing that's kind of tying you into the story it's the consistency it's the um uh, you're you're invested in their story, in them getting work, and them like their relationship with each other, and the fact that they're not very funny, and like all of this kind of stuff. They're they're one of the reasons why you stick around in the beginning of the show during all of the kind of more boring, in a way, stuff with the the investigation, the early setting stage moments of of the entire plot that's going to happen in the late, latter half of the show. Um, if you didn't have them, the show would be too much in the beginning. It, you, it wouldn't have anything that kept your attention and gave you those breaks needed when they're thrusting information at you. Yeah, the show would be a lot duller, yeah. too, because, again, we're we're taught in anime, like, if, if they're subtitling something, it's important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Um, and because everything is tied together in this show... One of the comedic duo is um, the boyfriend to the main pop idol girl who uh, is, like, he has no ambition. She has a lot of ambition. She specifically likes him because he has no ambition um, and she feels like she can take a break when she's around him. Um, That's kind of it for that. That's it. Pretty much. Um, And then I think we're kind of just at... (laughs) The doctor and the girlfriend. Yes. So the doctor is a friend of Otokawa's, and he notices that Otokawa has a sleeping disorder, Mm -hmm. but he's not certain what's causing it. So a lot of the show is essentially him trying to figure out what's wrong with Otokawa, whereas... uh, 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 Shirakawa? Yeah, Shirakawa. She is essentially like she's in love with Otakawa. Mm-hmm. We're not a hundred percent certain what they are with one another because that's never fully wrapped up mm-hmm. in essence. Mm-hmm. However, she gets close to Otakawa because of Dobu, because again, Dobu believes that Otakawa is the one who kidnapped the girl. Mm-hmm. And Shirakawa and Dobu had a thing. It eventually gets played off as Stockholm Syndrome, which is very possible, but again, it's never fully explained. Yeah, well... um, Like, what their actual relationship is? I, In my head, it's doubtful that it's Stockholm, because Stockholm has to... You have to have one thing that's incredibly traumatic, and then the kidnapping, right? And that that's supposed to be, like... At least this is from my very... Like, I haven't taken psychology. I don't know. Um, But, like... It's got to be like something really, really bad or traumatic or like dramatic happens. Kidnapping happens afterwards. You relate to the kidnapper because they are your comfort space after this really big traumatic thing, right? So she has the the relationship afterwards, but she doesn't have the traumatic thing, or at least it's not established that she has the traumatic thing first. So Stockholm, I don't think, in my mind, I think just abusive codependency shit you know 
Well, the thing about it is, is that a lot of abusive relationships actually show symptoms of mm-hmm. Stockholm syndrome symptoms, because absolutely. the way that the abusers like try to manipulate the people being abused. So there is certainly symptoms mm-hmm. to, if not like full blown Stockholm syndrome, depending on the situation. Again, nothing is fully cleared up it's, as far as yeah. that's concerned. So it's technically a loose end just because it's not fully explained like it's resolved but not explained enough to where you're not still left with some kind of questions for the sake of Mm -hmm. plot advancement yeah so but it's definitely manipulation um uh gaslighting like the ugly situation of and extortion Mm -hmm. (laughs) extortion of blackmail and oh yeah um yeah so dobu bad guy um he and Shiokawa were girlfriend boyfriend she had a nurse school debt um she loaned some money from him it's been several years she can't pay it back he's increased the interest whole thing um she starts stealing drugs she's a nurse she starts stealing drugs from um Otakawa's friend the gorilla who's the doctor who's helping Otakawa with his sleep disorder um and the gorilla ends up having to shut down his practice because of this, because if it gets out, it's known that it's an inside job. If it gets out, the drugs are going missing from his practice. It would ruin the practice's reputation. So he would rather just close shops quietly and uh, then start up another practice either later on down the line or go work for a bigger hospital or whatever. It was just better for him to close it down. This is kind of the initial reason as to why Orakawa gets involved in everything is because um, he's mad at Dobu for stealing from Shirakawa. He's, Shirakawa has also started to, like she was following Dobu's orders to get close to him because Dobu wanted to know what was up with him because the girl in the back of his cab, you know? So he wanted that footage that was in his cab. So he told Shirakawa to get involved with him. She then falls in love with him during that process, then confesses to him all of this shit after Odakawa has already kind of like started sussing her out. Um, and then because of that, Odakawa then goes on this vengeance mission of like, I'm going to arrest Dobu, but because of that, I have to arrest his, like the guy who's above him. I also have to arrest Yano. I also have to figure out what's going on with this, this girl group. It's kind of the, the thing that stops him from being like, I'm just going to hand over the footage from my cab and then move on with my life. This is the, the catalyst to him really jumping into the deep end of, of finding out what's happening here. Yeah. Yeah. Which takes us to Tanaka, who is the, the. Otakawa. Are we going to do Otakawa before we do Tanaka? Uh, we can do either one. Who's Tanaka again? Tanaka's the big bad, the crazy bad, the cray cray. Oh, you're talking about the, the game guy. one from the group? Game guy who's obsessed with this phone. Oh. Yeah. You know, I just completely glossed over him because at the end of the day, I feel like he was actually in, inconsequential to the plot. He kind of is. He is... He's kind of, like, there to give action. Like, he's there to make things move forward. Yeah, and I get it. Like, out of everybody in the show, I feel like Homeboy has the most amount of growth. But although he has, like, the most amount of growth, at the end of the day, he is so inconsequential to the plot to where I just, I don't care. He, well, he has so much, like, I get, growth is, a, in a sense, he grows both forwards and backwards. <laughs> Um, yeah, like he changes he's there, then he's not, then he's there, then he's not, and then at the very end, he finally like picks himself back up, dusts himself off, and like redeems himself but has after the fact. Zero consequences for shooting someone almost fatally. Yeah. So again, I'm not. But also, I don't child abuse. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So again, I don't. I'm so unsure whenever it comes to his character, because again, there's so much there to unpack and try to figure out, mm. but it just, it's very anticlimactic how it ends because it's like, Oh, I'm a shoot or I'm a try to kill Otokawa, but instead Dobu's pressuring me and he's like, Oh, you ain't got any bullets left. So boom, shoots Dobu and then has a psychological breakdown 
and just hightails it away and then decides to change his life around and then he actually becomes a good worker and is fine with his life and erases the Zootopia game that's on his phone because of a fucking extinct bird. Yeah, uh, I found his episode with the erases and everything kind of tedious. I mean... I think the thing about it is is that unlike the comedy duo, his character I don't feel like is necessarily super essential to the plot. Um, yeah. I I think the show would be the same without him. And I do think... I agree. Yeah, and I think the episode where we get all of his backstory and stuff like that kind of seems a little bit ridiculous. I mean, mm-hmm. like, I think what the thing about it is is that it's a big deal to him. Like the, the situation with the eraser and him going on this bidding war and stealing his brother's computer to be able to do this and stealing his dad's credit card and all this kind of stuff. Like it's a very big deal to him and to his character, especially considering the result of what happens and then how that ties into the boss and everything. And the fact that like he was the one to sell the eraser that didn't actually follow through with it. But it doesn't really feel su- like a super big deal to the viewer and the moment of where he gets beaten up by his father just feels abrupt and uncomfortable, but it doesn't necessarily feel like it's abrupt and uncomfortable for the purpose of the story. It just kind of feels like it's abrupt and uncomfortable because it is. Yeah. So he's probably my least favorite aspect of the show. I can agree with that because, again, he's so inconsequential mm. to the plot. The high schooler that hangs out with a comedy duo – I care more about Agreed. than this guy. Yeah. And I'm, yeah. And I guess the thing of like him getting zero consequences for anything, like freaking monkey dude, edgy got more consequences than he did. Mm-hmm. And he literally shot someone after yeah. terrorizing them for like a month. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. So Otakawa main plot line. <laughs> Otakawa. Our boy, mm-hmm. our boy. Mm-hmm. What a homie. The biggest homie. Yeah, so our boy, Otokawa, Mm -hmm. he went through some shit as a kid that is later on explained. Mm -hmm. However, he just wants to drive a taxi. He wants to pay off the agency that let him live on his own, let him be able to get to the point where he could have his own taxi business Mm -hmm. and live his life. However, he gets entangled with Shitagawa, with Dobu, with fucking Tanaka trying to hunt him down and kill him. Mm -hmm. He literally gets entangled in a web of shit that he wants nothing to do with. He gets entangled in the kidnapping case, all of that. Homeboy doesn't deserve any of the shit that he's put through. But also some of that he kind of brings on himself with his attitude and smart elegness. But also we can kind of appreciate that. Yeah. So he, he's obviously our main character. When he was, again, like as I was saying before, like when you start watching this, you don't know if he's good or bad. And you don't know if he's good or bad until the very end of the show. And the very end of the show leaves you with that he's neither good nor bad. He's human. Leaning on the good side <laughs> compared to the other characters, but he's human. Uh, and so we learned that he had an accident when he was younger because his parents were a whole mess and um, uh, his mom drives the family um, into the ocean in a murder-suicide and attempted murder of him. But he gets out of the car and escapes. And But in this, he ends up with a head injury that causes a uh, mental uh, like block I guess um that means that he has a strange memory like he has this ability they describe it as kind of being like synthesis synthesis you know the way you can like smell taste colors that kind of thing um yep. hear colors I think that's probably the most common one that I hear about people hearing colors um uh, he has that kind of thing where he's just like, you know, like some people are like face blind. He's the opposite of face blind. He can see something that is very like generic and know who it is. Or um, he can see like a text message or like a, a 
just something that isn't really super like obvious as to who a person is and he knows who did it he gets body language easier he gets cadence easier than other people he has this this innate ability because of this accident as like a brain protection mechanism in doing so as well though He's also, because he had this affinity, like his dad, when his dad was going to cheat on his mom, his dad would drop him off at the zoo and he like connected that. Like he was like, I prefer animals than humans. He's been in a very abusive household as a child. He's very young. He's trying to protect himself. He's like five years old at this point or like 10 years old, like between five and 10. He's 10 when his parents die, but he's like, you know, a very young child during this time period. And he's protecting himself. And so he's like relating everything to animals. So when he hits his head, has his accident, he wakes up. All of a sudden, everyone is anthropomorphized. And that's revealed at the end. Um, it, we get to see everyone's human forms. We get to see them all as humans. And how, uh, because he then drives a car off a bridge, tries to drown himself again. Um, and his brain corrects himself, which I don't think is, I mean, I know that like, like if you hit your head once and you forget things sometimes if you hit your head again you can like remember things and stuff but i don't think it would necessarily reverse something like I anyway, it's anime it's fine um uh and then he yeah he he wakes up and he sees he sees everyone is human again which was very interesting i mean not gonna lie from the time the show started and the more we kind of got to get mm-hmm. introduced to the characters the seed kind of got planted in my brain mm-hmm. And especially whenever they were going over the whole thing of, like, he's not able to sleep. Yeah. And all that stuff's going on. I was like, I wonder if it's a psychological issue to where, like, he perceives people as animals, which would explain how he knows people like the Mm -hmm. girl that ends up catfishing his homie. Like, he knows her as the calico cat. Yeah. And things along those lines Mm -hmm. to where I started to pick up on it. And I was like, yeah, like maybe the way that he is able to remember people so distinctly is because he sees them as those animals to where like that's how his brain associates it. Because they kind of allude to it to where once he sees people as humans again, like his memory isn't as good. Um, In the comments, I I was seeing people saying like, oh, yeah, I kind of got that one. Um, And I think that makes sense to me. The thing that I find interesting is that I remember hearing him say things like, oh, she's the calico cat out loud, but I would be interested Mm. to go back and watch it again and see if he was only saying those things to himself or in internal dialogues and stuff, because I don't know if he ever verbalized that out loud. I think he may have, like, to the manager. Mm. He's like, that's not the calico cat that I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't remember it being in italics no. sometimes, if that makes sense. Because typically in subbed anime, whenever people are having an internal dialogue for those that don't watch subbed anime, mm. it's done in italics to represent that what's being said is either not seen mm-hmm. or not heard. So I feel like there were times whenever it wasn't in italics, so he actually said it. Mm-hmm. However, my memory could be foggy on that. I'm not 100% certain. Yeah, that's kind of how I feel as well. It's, it's like, I, that's why another one of the reasons why I want to watch it again is because I want to go through and watch it and like, and try and see, like, did he ever say anything that would like weird anybody out? Like, did he ever, ever say, mm. you know, ah, oh, you're a, 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 cause I feel like he said to Shirakawa, um, you're the only alpaca. How do you recognize it was me? Well, you're the only alpaca. I know. You know, I feel like he said that. Yeah. But like, if he was saying Yeah, that, and again, like he constantly refers to people like either to himself or to them that they are gorilla-like. Yeah. Or uh, like whatever animal that he associates them with mm. to where I was like, huh, okay. So he associates them as that. And that's obviously how they are being portrayed yeah. to us. Therefore, it kind of makes sense that it's kind of told from that perspective. And again, at the end of the day, starting with that premise and going to it, that is a brilliant way to do storytelling. But also how impactful it is whenever the cat comes out of the door 
at the end and he sees it and he's like, oh, thank God you're a cat. Yeah. Like that is incredibly powerful looking back on it now and like actually focusing on that for a minute. Mm -hmm. Like, again, the fact that this man was so worried that he didn't actually know what was in his house, whether it was a human or not yeah. because of his disability and then it coming to and he sees that it's a cat mm -hmm. and he's just so relieved over that. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know why like thinking on it and like trying to analyze it. Like it makes me a little emotional thinking about it. I think it's the fear of his like, own mind. That's fucking heavy. Yeah. It's like the, yeah. the fear of his own mind, the fear of his own disorder of like, I think I'm a good guy, but have I actually done something in all of this? That's like, like bad like like and then mm -hmm. that i think relates very much to the viewer because he's feeling what the viewer's feeling at that point of like we think that he's the good guy we think that the main character is a good guy otoko is the good guy by this point but we still have that fear of him because of the amount of like little subtle plot twists that have happened throughout the to this point that he could have just somebody else just in there just some random other person and him as the main character yeah. having the same fear that we do as the viewer was very interesting. And uh, I thought it was a really, mm -hmm. really good point. So um, I think if he verbally has said to people, you're what, like whatever animal or whatever, and they don't clock it, I don't think I will find the show as clever as I would do if those were all internal, but made to seem like they were external. So I'm very interested to watch it again. Mm -hmm. um, because I would definitely, like if somebody called me an alpaca, I would have questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can I can see yeah. that 100%. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm curious about that. Uh, which leads us to the biggest plot point that I don't think anybody saw, which was the who actually, who done it? I'm not going to lie. Mm -hmm. I suspected it. You suspected? Mm. I thought it was going to be the Calico. I don't because she actually, like, her confliction over Edgy is what kind of, like, made me drop her from the suspect list. Now, right. I will say it was either between her or the other one. But I lean towards the other one, again, just because of her conviction over Edgy and how conflicted she was over it. Mm-hmm. But I still couldn't 100% stamp it. Like, the thing with Otokawa, like, I could 100% stamp that, that it was a psychological disability. Yeah. But with the actual whodunit, I was like, she's my main suspect, just because she had the most to gain over that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like, I couldn't... I feel like what ultimately put it together for me was whenever I realized that Otokawa it actually was a psychological disability. Yeah. To the point to where I was like, okay, so in a world where he has this superhuman ability to remember faces, but also he has this disorder to where he sees everyone as animals, and so therefore he sees these two black cats, and they are very similar, but he isn't 100% certain on distinguishing between the two until his memory is jogged of what the actual disappeared one looks like. Mm -hmm. It got me thinking to the point of, okay, so she obviously replaced her because she looks the most like it. And the masks are there to hide the fact mm -hmm. that she is fake. And those masks only cover up so much of the face to where obviously it's there because they are so similar, mm -hmm. but there's just enough difference to where their most hardcore fans would even be thrown off by it. Mm -hmm. To where I was like, this is actually like a perfect kind of plan fall together mm -hmm. to where, and especially after it was revealed that she was a fourth place, I was like, all right, I'm sold. Mm -hmm. Like you've given me enough evidence. And then whenever it finally came out, I was like, fuck Yeah. Yeah, And, like, I was still surprised by it. Don't get me wrong. Like, I kind of popped for it. But it was more or less on the way of, okay, I was actually right in assuming that. Mm -hmm. But, again, I just couldn't stamp it like I did with Otokawa's. Yeah, so I think the thing that made me think that it was the Calico, I guess I was thinking that it was the Calico from 
early on and just kind of didn't really change my opinion after that um, because I thought it was the calico when she was like really um, like self-conscious and kind of meek mm. and um, like not and like you know I thought it was like I the, she was very unsuspecting then and normally with murder mysteries if they're unsuspecting they did it um, and uh, mm. and then the thing with with edgy happened and she then said you know oh I was disgusted with you and never wanted to spend time with you and everything and that did kind of throw me off for a bit but I didn't like change my mind after that and I don't know why it just seemed like she was she was the bad guy um and so mm. so it didn't really change my mind I had other theories I thought that it could have been Shun the the kid who won the lottery um just because again if you're unsuspecting then there's a good chance that you did it and um he was so obsessive over um uh Rui uh and wanting her to be the lead and everything but he seemed genuinely disappointed when the dancing went down a level so I didn't know about that so it was just kind of like a yeah I don't I didn't really know who to suspect in the end uh but I didn't expect it it was her I didn't feel like she was fleshed you know out who that else way. like I yeah you know who else I could have like I had like a slight suspicion towards who the boyfriend oh good shout because again, like there was no other reason for that storyline to be shoehorned in, yeah, whatsoever. Like I could have done without that. Did I think it was a sweet situation? Yes. Like I thought it was adorable that those two got along because you have the overly ambitious and then the no ambition whatsoever. Mm. But also, it was because of that t- relationship to where I was like, you know. I could see this going this particular way because she could have confided in him and been like, hey, you know, I just uh, don't, like, I'm not going to be the lead anymore. And then, like, he for a moment is like, don't you worry, I got this. Yeah. I could see that. I but again, that. I don't know. So it's, it crossed my mind, but this entire show just had my brain working over time and it's not often that that actually happens and i'm very thankful that we covered this like it's not often to where i sit down and i'm like i am so grateful that we covered it but holy shit Mm. it was fun yeah it was definitely a good watch and even if we've spoiled the whole thing for you now if you haven't watched it i do recommend that you watch it and if you've watched it once I recommend you watch it again. Like I'm, I'm going to watch it again for sure and, and see if I can spot anything new. Mm. Um, if you've seen it multiple times, what did you catch on the second, third, fourth time you watched it, however many times you watched it? What did you catch later on? Um, I'm curious about that because I want to I want to know if there's anything that you didn't catch that we caught the first time viewing or if there's anything that you're surprised that we didn't catch. Hmm. Um, and let us know about that yeah. in the comments or the DMs or wherever you want to reach out to us about. Because, again, yeah. we appreciate hearing from you guys. Those people that have sent us DMs, you know who you are. And we genuinely really appreciate it. We do. We do. Um, so, yeah. Uh, what do you rate it? I'm torn between a nine and a nine and a half. That's high. I feel like it's warranted, though. Mm. Because the show had so much character development. Maybe not necessarily growth for a lot of characters, but it fully fleshed out so many characters. Its story was compelling from start to finish, minus Homeboy with the Eraser. And if anything, Homeboy with the Eraser is the whole reason I'm probably not giving it a 10. Because the OP and the ED were bangers. The animation for what it was was extremely compelling Mm. for what it had going on. Again, everything about it just captivated me from start to finish to where I genuinely did not want to put it down. I had to take breaks because again, it made me uncomfortable, but also that level of uncomfortable is what I feel like kept like bringing me back to it Mm -hmm. because I feel like the reason it probably made me so uncomfortable was because it's very, it's not often to where I have to overthink things and try to piece things together, especially whenever it comes to an anime. 
but also it hit on some really like tough subjects, like real subjects. Like everything about this is probably something that's playing out somewhere right now in real life. Mm. Like it's just real. And I feel like that is just what drew me to it. Yeah. So again, because of its falters here or there, I'm probably just going to give it a nine instead of a 10 because it is not perfect. But holy shit, it is one of the most entertaining, like overall entertaining anime that we've watched in a long time, at least as, at least in my opinion. Yeah, uh, I, I'm i sitting at an 8 right now. I think the things that are knocking it down for me as well is, again, that one character, the Eraser dude. I, I found his episode tedious. I found the child abuse uncomfortable for uncomfortable sake um, and not super relevant. Like, his whole arc, his whole story I didn't find to be necessary to the plot. And, I yeah, I, I would have been fine without his character in general. Um, and then also, I'm taking off a point as well, because at the moment, I'll have to double check this, in which case my score may change. But at the moment, I feel like Odakawa verbalized that people were animals to them. And if they didn't clock that as strange, then, you know, I feel like that's that's a strange thing, for, especially considering that they weren't complimentary animals all the time. Like, for him to refer to his almost girlfriend as an alpaca, it's not very complimentary to her. And I feel like he did verbalize that to her. Um, and because there was no, like, I would have even accepted just like a look of like confusion on her face would have been fine that would have done it for mm. me um but because there was nothing well, there i don't know i will say whenever it came to the uh the thing with shitakawa and even with the manager of mystery kiss mm -hmm. i feel like he said that they were like a yeah, but insert still, animal here. If you said your girlfriend was like an alpaca, she's gonna look at you funny. <laughs> like, like it's well, not I mean, nice. Again, people attribute things in weird ways. I don't see what's wrong with alpacas. They're nice animals. They're, they're, would I ever, would I ever compare my girlfriend to an alpaca? No, because she doesn't remind me of an alpaca. I feel if like anything. She's a cat lady, so she reminds me of a cat. Yeah, okay, so the Calico cat, I can feel like it's fine, because Calicos are rare, and she's an idol, and, like, it, it's, yeah, okay, I can see that. I just look like a Calico cat. Fair enough, you know? The alpaca one's what throws me. If you're talking to a, a love interest, and you say that they remind you of an alpaca, or they look like an alpaca, or I could tell who you were because you're the only alpaca around here, which I think was the context, um... They're going to at least look at you funny. And because I don't remember that happening, I'm sitting at an eight right now. If if there was context to that, that I'm not remembering, I'm misremembering something, then my score may change. For now, that's where I'm sitting. So eight slash nine question mark on the schedule. <laughs> I, I'm sticking at an eight right now. But speaking of are you can how's your score faring after a week uh last week we reviewed bubble um the movie and you sat at a 6.5 question mark what are your thoughts now i haven't had time to think about it because i've been so goddamn stressed about having to finish to animate for us to be able to record in the middle of a week <laughs> yeah so between that being stressed about how much shit I have going on this weekend and going to meet the girlfriend's parents. I'm just, I haven't even given it any thought. So come back to me next week and I promise I will have thought about it some more. <laughs> I don't know. I, I have thought about this movie. This movie has not escaped my brain this entire week. You can ask my mom and my brother because, oh my God, boy dates a bubble. <laughs> then that sentence has i've we we've got a puzzle going on the kitchen table right now me and my mom occasionally sit down to do it and for some reason that puzzle has just been triggering my brain to be like i cannot believe they made a film where a boy dates a freaking bubble i cannot get puzzle, over that film. bubble close enough i can't get over that film it's ridiculous the plot doesn't make any sense i'm going into a ramble about it 
I, I can, this is my dive. This is turning into my dive. Like it's every moment that I think about it, this film gets worse and worse in my brain. The only thing that's acceptable about it is the fact that it's got a good soundtrack and the, and the visuals are nice. But like, I, this plot is blowing my mind. It's blowing my mind how dumb. <laughs> the thing about it is, is that Bubble at least has redeeming qualities. Dive has absolutely zero redeeming qualities. Those abs don't exist. Go look at free. You want to see abs? Go look at free. Um, but You want something aesthetically pleasing to look at? Go look at free. Yeah, Go but, look at that fucking rugby anime but that Bubble... we watched. Go look at Q, just not season four, because that was done by Ghibli and it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But Bubble is 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 turning into a, a freaking a horror film anyway. But it's, uh, the, the ending is terrifying. But okay, regardless of that, we've been going for two hours, so let's wrap this shit up. God, this is the longest fucking episode we've recorded in a long time. It is. It is. There's a lot to talk about today. All right, so let's wrap this thing up. So you can find Blue on Instagram and Twitter at d- 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 Blue Lavender STU. <laughs> yeah, and you can find Brad on Twitch and Instagram at Brad Carter Gaming. You can find both of us at BNB Anime on all of your favorite social media platforms. We also have a YouTube channel, BNB Anime, the same thing. But you can watch these episodes um, or, well, listen, I suppose it's still auditory. Um, and uh, if you are currently listening on YouTube, you're a week behind. You can listen to one more episode if you hop on over to your favorite podcasting app thing platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, that kind of shit. Um, you also can download the episodes directly from the website if you want to, www.bnbanime.com. Next week, what have we got? Have we decided if we're going to do Bell or not? I think we're probably going to do Bell. Let's do another movie next week. Okay, so Bell it is. Bell is a hit anime sensation that hit theaters not too long ago and is actually, I think it hit theaters right around the time that I went to go see Sing a Bit of Harmony. Mm-hmm. So, unfortunately, I had to choose one or the other, and I went with Sing a Bit of Harmony, which I do not regret in any way, shape, form, or fashion. So, with that being said, I'm excited to sit down and watch this with you, because visually, it looks great. How does the story hold up? I don't fucking know. However, it should be fun, nonetheless. Yes. So, come back next week for that. That's it, bitches. We out. (laughs) Bye-bye. Bye.